Josh, what's going on, man? Welcome to Dad Edge. Uh, happy to be here. Yeah, man. Savage. You're looking savage, actually. So um, the be- beard's on point, like everything. You, yeah. The beard's okay, actually. It's it, it could be it could be less savage and more gentleman today. <laughs> it just you know it depends. Right now we're uh, uh, we're we're trying to make up for some lost time. We had a power outage here in Salt Lake City due to some uh, unusually high winds. I think the record, the highest they recorded over the day was like 112 miles an hour. So we just had a crazy windstorm that knocked out a ton of trees and killed the power here. We did as much as we could with the lights off, but you know, a lot of the stuff we do is kind of old school and, and, and old fashioned and that sort of way. But there's a certain point where you still need some technology uh, to get the job done. So as you can see, I'm here in the shop um, and, and we've got guys working. So if you hear some noise and some clanging and banging, the uh, the elves are steady at work, and <laughs> you'll see them transitioning in the background, perhaps. All good, man. Uh, hey, we're doing like we're we're like homeschooling right now because of COVID. So oh, like, yeah. It's, How's that? So first day of school was a couple weeks ago. ago. Yesterday. Yeah. Oh, you guys started earlier. Right. Yeah. As we released this show, it was, a, it was a few months ago. So you might, at this point in time, as 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 the audience hears this, we, mm. they, we I might be in the mental institution at this point. Okay, Burr, you're living in the future no. right now. I can't even comprehend that. <laughs> you're, we're talking now, but you're referencing the past right. of when this is happening. Holy crap! I know. That's a lot. Ooh. It's like the Matrix or something. It really right? is, man. Yeah. Like, my brain can't comprehend that. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, so let, let's start here, man. So I obviously I know a lot about you, uh, but let's start. Let's start with with Josh as a kid. So tell us about your tell us about your upbringing. Oh boy. Okay. Uh, so as a young lad, I was had a different trajectory than than where my life ended up. Now, I I was, for a lack of a better term, like super nerdy. Um, and, and really into like science and, and, and learning. And that, that was kind of my thing. I was going to grow up and be a scientist. Um, I, I wasn't particularly athletic, wasn't particularly coordinated. Um, but, I, but I played sports because I don't know, that was the thing that you did. And I enjoyed them. I just wasn't great at it. Uh, but I wanted to be better. And, and over time, I, I kind of <laughs> forced myself to, to, improve and become more athletic. And I realized that uh, for whatever reason, I don't know if I just received more positive feedback from those endeavors than I did the academic side, academic, academia, whatever. But then I, but I started shifting and, and, and driving down that road, I guess. And, and the seed was planted to become a professional athlete at an early age. And, and it wasn't until much later in life that I found fighting as the means. I, I thought I was going to be a pro football player. And then I just never grew past, you know, like 10th grade, um, which for, for you, probably I never grew past, past like fifth grade you. Um, but I stopped at about 10th grade and then maxed out um, on, on height. I, I put on a little bit more girth since then, but uh, the, the NFL direction was not going to happen. And I was, I didn't have the right temperament um, or finesse to play baseball, even though I enjoyed baseball. Um, wrestling seemed to be more my speed. There was just more hands on. And I grad, and so that was the, the means for me to continue to compete athletically. So I went in transition. Um, to co- collegiate athletics, wrestled in college, and then transitioned to fighting. But as as a young kid growing up, um, you know that 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 was a dream of mine. That was something that I wanted to pursue, but I didn't have a clear path when I was younger. It was so it was always just floating in the back of my mind. Um, the, the the scientist thing. I don't know when that when that faded away. Um, maybe maybe middle school again as my. At, athletic stuff started taking over more. Um, and then that just kind of followed that path. So what was it like, uh, for you with your parents, like, especially your dad, what was, what was the relationship like with him? I, it, it was good. Um, the, the thing, the thing that I realized, you know, again, was, was, 
it seemed like I got more positive feedback from what I did in sports. Like doing well in school was almost kind of a given, right? And so there wasn't there wasn't a huge reward system for excelling, right? So I mean, I was I was identified uh, gifted in like I don't know how maybe like kindergarten or something, you know. And then it was like, oh, I guess he's pretty smart, and so okay, cool, that's covered. And so it didn't really matter. I I would I would do well and score, you know, 99th percentile and all these things. And it's like, you know, small, you know, golf clap with that. But if I did something athletically, the, the, the feedback was, it apparently had more of an impact because that was the direction that I ended up going in, but the relationship was good, very supportive. Um, you know, maybe, maybe more critical than what I needed. Like looking back, you know, as a father now and kind of Monday morning quarterbacking some stuff, you know, looking at it, the way that I interact with my daughter as compared to the way I was interacted with, it's like, Oh yeah, man, there was, there was some, some nitpicking there that probably didn't need to occur. And, and, and I know that it was done with the best of intentions. Um, my dad had me when I, I, he was 19. So, I mean, for most of my childhood, he was still a kid and I don't, it's hard to realize how profound that, that can be until you've had kids of your own. And then, you know, we, I was a little bit older, but looking at myself now, even at 35 and, and trying to be a father, it's like putting myself in that same space and like at 25 holy crap, I am not equipped <laughs> to, uh, to, to navigate these waters. And so, uh, you know, there was, we were all learning, I think, you know, you, you referenced this um, in, in our podcast that we did together a while ago, where you tell your kids, you're like, hey man, I'm, today's my first day of being a dad to a seven, year, seven and, you know, three week old kid or whatever. Um, and it's, so it was the same thing, but, but, you know, the, the love was there. The support was there. Um, there was some, there was some guidance and, and direction that, that maybe again, looking back, I think I would have responded to differently, but I was a different kid. I was a weird, you know, I like not a normal individual. And so if I were raising me, I would have, I would have done things differently because I respond to stuff differently than, than the average person does, whatever that means. And how many kids do you have now? So I have two now. Okay. And, and they are very distinctly different. I, my, my daughter is, is very much like me. I don't know if it's a first child thing. I don't know if it's born in the winter months thing. I, I have no idea, but she has, I see so much of my personality in her. Um, and, and then my son has a lot of my traits, but he has a completely different temperament and the way that, I handle them and my wife and I, we handle them together is very different. The approach has to be uh, distinctive because she does not respond to the same input and stimulus as he does. It, it, and, and that's something that I think a lot of us, it's easy to fall into the trap of like, this is how you parent, you know, and make a blanket statement of, okay, this is how I dad to all kids, you know, of all ages and at any point in time, this is, this is how I, uh, implement that. And, and, and I think it's, it's far more fluid than, than, than a lot of times we believe. Oh yeah. Without a doubt, man. So how old are they? So five and a half and two and a half. Okay. Yeah. You guys so are still any? pretty little. Yeah. There uh, you have more, have any more, Whew, man. I <laughs> not, <laughs> we'll see. Well, you know, truthfully it's like, I, I don't have that. I gotta, you know, someone else knows. I don't know that, you know, yeah. I don't know what the future may hold. We, we don't, intend to anytime soon. Um, I would be happy, I think, with just two based off of the dynamic right now. You know, talk to me in a couple of years, maybe that changes. Um, we're, we're just getting to the point now where they're pretty self-sufficient, like the five and a half year old, she can like do chores and we've got our cleaning bathrooms. And so it's like, man, it would be nice to have a little bit uh, stronger workforce, you know, but then you got to start from scratch all over again. And now the two and a half year old, he's starting to get more uh, independent and not require so much. And it's like, man, do I really want to revert back and and start all over again? So I don't know. I mean, right now I would say no, but you know, like we'll see. 
You never know, right? Yeah. You never, you never know. I mean, I, yeah. I think I think for sure, if we had a third, that would be absolute max capacity. Like, yeah. I don't see a world where we could manage any more than three. Being being away, so we're none of our family is out here. We're out here in Salt Lake, uh, but all of our family is back in Virginia, and so that that plays a huge part. Not having that support system makes it a lot harder when you're just kind of on your own. If we were back home, maybe maybe it would be a no-brainer. Like, yeah, dude, we're gonna have like ten kids. Let's go. You know, let's just get after it. Um, but for sure, two feels good right now. I hear you, man. We we said no more after two, and then two more. How'd that came. work out for you? Yeah, and then two more came. So and they're and they're all boys. Uh, so it's oh, it's 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 madness, madness. Mm-hmm. But hey, that's why I do the podcast. Keeps me grounded. I, yeah, you know, and I'm sure. Th- <laughs> there is there's some usefulness right and you have learned you know quite a few lessons to impart for the, on the rest of us who maybe weren't quite um I, is, I don't know if it's brave enough or foolish enough or whatever it was to to embark on such a journey and and you know um maybe it's maybe it's um is it is it like masochistic a little bit like to to punish yourself that much but it's it can be crazy right i mean i keep i say this a lot on the podcast because it the one thing that i've found raising four boys is you have to keep a sense of humor so i can either be incredibly annoyed or i can laugh and you know one is good and one is not yeah. so like i i joke about it but i'm like you know it's like you know, people ask me, they're like, Oh my gosh, like four boys. It sounds like a lot. I was like, it's like raising four drunk people at all times. It's like a drunk fraternity party that you never leave. I was like, cause they say things out loud and I say things out loud that I never would say to any other human being on the face of the earth. Like, please don't eat your cheese and crackers while you poop. Like, yeah. For the love of God. Did I really just say it? Yeah. Yeah. You wrote that down. If you read that in a book, you'd be like, what is happening? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You would have said you're at a party. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, and, and I guess the other thing too, and, and this is something that my wife struggles with, even with just the two kids, is like, man, you you have to really um, let go of your attachment to things, um, to to like tangible goods, and 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 a certain level of cleanliness. It's not as though you're going to live in a pigsty, but it's like, hey, man, you your house will never be as clean as it was when it was just you and your wife. Like you, the, your, your stuff will never be as nice um, as, you know, your, your car will never be as nice as when you got it and you're 16 years old and that was your baby. And the only oh, thing yeah. you had to do in your life was to keep it, you know, spit, shine and polish. Like that, that, you know, you have to set, you know, what is a reasonable expectation for uh, the general state of things and, and understanding that the level, it, the more kids you put in the mix, the, the higher that level of chaos uh, becomes. Dude, we, you have to become in, intimate with the notion of entropy because everything it just is continuing unlevel. Sorry. No, you're good. Hey, our, our house does get clean. And the cleanest our house ever is, is 10 minutes after we clean it. And then after that, yep. it's crazy again. And then our car, yeah, you're right. Our car is nothing but a goldfish buffet on wheels. Cause that's pretty much what you find everywhere in that. Yeah. So, but you know, tell us, uh, tell us about your wife. How long have you guys been together? So we will be coming up on uh, nine years. So we got married in 2011 and I, and I, did that specifically to make the math easy um, uh, for myself, and so so yes, yeah, so we've been together for for quite a while now. We dated for about a year and a half before we finally got married. So, um, you know, she she is an excellent mother. She's way more put together than I am. She is the the organized and structured one in the relationship, which is super important. Uh, but, but again, with this idea of entropy, you, you need someone who can understand and appreciate chaos and the fact that things are going to fall apart and degradate and how to work within that. Because if you, if everything you own is this Fabergé egg, um, and you just spend the rest of your life trying to put those pieces constantly together, you're going to go insane. You, you cannot function in that environment when you have a, a, a system that is as dynamic as a household full of kids. And so there's, there's a good balance there because if it was entirely up to me, the wheels would fall right off. 
just complete. I'll be a hundred percent honest. So she, she really is, you know, the, the one that kind of keeps me from, from going too, too far out in the, into the weeds there. Um, it would be very easy for me to just like, you know what, man, that's it. We're just all packing up and moving into the hills and we're just going to be hill people. And I would be okay with that. We'd live off the land. I would just, you know, become even hairier than I am now and, <laughs> you know, chop down trees and, and, you know, wrestle grizzly bears or whatever it is you do in that environment, uh, which would not be great for the business and would come with its own, you know, shortcomings. So she keeps me from just turning completely feral or allowing the kids to become totally feral, which I think is a good thing for, for modern day society. But, I, but also you need a little bit of that. Um, right. If you, we lose sight of that, you become too sterile and too, um, I think there is such a thing as being overly civilized. And that leads it to its own problems in of itself. And so that's, that, that's part of our dynamic. And, and, and I'm really blessed and lucky that she can fill in the gaps that I, in the spaces that I don't have. So we, we, we do compliment each other quite well. And she puts up with quite a bit of my <laughs> nonsense, which I'm also very thankful for. You're thankful for your nonsense. I, I'm thankful that she <laughs> tolerates my nonsense. Right. Um, you know, and then maybe the, the nonsense is a good thing because the world would be a very boring place if, if people Agreed. didn't have some of their nuances, let's, let's say. Very true, my friend. Very true. And so, you know, speaking of wrestling grizzly bears, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> t- tell us how you got into MMA. You know, we we've done this. You know, been doing this show for five. Oh wow, we're going on almost six years now. Holy crap! Uh, but we we man, we've been blessed with some amazing MMA guys. We we had Frankie Edgar on twice. Um, and I'm always, I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated by you guys who train for this. You know, you get in the cage, you, you know, you, it, it takes a lot of mental resilience. It takes mm-hmm. a lot of emotional resilience, a lot of mental toughness, a lot of f- physicality to it. But how did you step into your fighting career? You're like, yeah, you know, I, I think I'm going to go ahead and do this. You know, <laughs> the grizzly bears are too hard to catch. So I'm just going to go fight humans. Yeah. Well, there's just not enough of them, you know, they're pretty <laughs> sparse and there's a lot of, there's, there's way too much cardio. Cause you got to track them and run them. <laughs> you know, they don't congregate like people do. Right. Um, well, first of all, let me, let me, let me start off by saying like, I, I probably don't belong in the same sentence as Frankie Edgar and, and fighting. And then me, uh, that, that guy's an absolute stud. And, and, and I would, you know, not, not being, not, not being overly humble, say like I am, you know, the okayest fighter that you, you probably haven't heard of. I mean, I did fight professionally and I fought in, in Bellator and all around the country and, and, and outside of the country as well. Um, but I, but I would never, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to mislead anyone to say like, Oh yeah, I, I, me and Frankie Edgar, same, same level. Um, so I, so I do like to give people a, a somewhat of a realistic expectation or, or understanding because there are levels of the sport, right? There are tiers, not all, not, you know, the, the guy who's fighting in the, you know, amateur show on Saturday nights down at the local, you know, uh, watering hole is not the same as the dude who's fighting for and winning UFC championships. There is a difference. It's the same sport, but you know, you're, you're talking about like rec league basketball in the NBA to some degree. And, and so I was somewhere in between just, so we'll, we'll just leave it at that. And so, you know, I, I got into it because I, I did want to compete professionally in some manner. And, and, and I wasn't really married to, to how I did that. I think it was, it was the allure was just, you know, physically pushing myself to reach, you know, the highest level that I could in some athletic uh, forum. And so recognizing early on that, that wrestling was probably more viable for me due to my size and the fact that there's weight classes and, and, and taking wrestling to its natural conclusion, um, you know, I, again, with wrestling, I wasn't good enough to continue to do that at the Olympic level. Once my collegiate eligibility was, was over, I was done wrestling at that point. And, and 
some guys that I was, was training with, some, some of my former teammates picked up MMA. And so as I was looking for something to fill that void where I still wanted to compete, they were like, hey, you should, you should come do MMA, man. I think you'd really like it. And I, I wish I had understood the sport sooner. I, I was still very, you know, in my younger days, because when it first came out, it was kind of underground, right? And, and there wasn't a lot known about it like you in order to watch it you had to buy the you had to rent the vhs tapes you know from <laughs> oh blockbuster God. right uh, to, to totally, put it totally in remember that yeah 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 and i don't know what what the what the age range of your listeners are that might be completely over some of their heads but you know when, when it first came out you were going and you were renting ufc one two and in, in the single digit stuff and that was the only way you could you could consume it and and at that point when i was introduced to it it, it, it kind of felt like maybe one or two notches above professional wrestling. And I was like, yeah, I don't know, man. That I didn't understand it. I had no comprehension. I'll just stick to, you know, real wrestling, not that fake stuff. And I wish I had been a little bit more open-minded. It, it also felt like it was very much like dojo karate. And and no offense to anyone who does karate or taekwondo or, or traditional martial arts, but it when you compare that, in terms of a fighting style to something like wrestling, there's a, there's a really big difference in, in the level of intensity and the physicality, everything that comes along with it. And, and the real world translation, right? Like, like I, I don't care what you say, Wing Chun or, or Tai Chi as applied to in the context of a fight with wrestling, they're not the same thing. Um, and you're probably going to have some karate guys just losing their mind. They're like, this guy doesn't know. I'll kick his ass. And to which case I would say, well, you know, many have tried and few have succeeded. So uh, <laughs> give it, you know. So, so, I, so I didn't understand it. And it wasn't until later on that I was introduced to it. And, and these guys kind of vouched for it. And the sport had evolved quite a bit by that time as well, where it was, it was less gimmicky and, and, you know, hokey. Cause even if you look at those earlier days, it was still kind of cheesy. Like, yeah, those dudes were beating the crap out of each other. It was pretty, um, serious, but it, it was nowhere near the level that the sport has, has gotten to at this point. And so that just seemed to be the logical progression. So I started training it and I was like, wait, so I can wrestle people and punch them in the face. <laughs> oh, this is what I've been missing. Cause yeah. I literally, I would say it's like, man, I'd be I'm okay at wrestling. I'd be super good at it if I could just elbow this dude every once in a while. Um, because that was, that was kind of my gift in wrestling is just that I was pretty tough and hard headed or stupid. I don't know how you want to attribute that, which is weird. Cause you know, I, I, I recognize that I just said like, Oh yeah, as a kid, I was super smart and like gifted. And at the same time, it's like, yeah, you could hit me with a brick and I would just look at you and not even care. I don't know. That's a weird dichotomy. I recognize that. Um, but, but that also did kind of help me as a fighter. It's like, okay, I have a pretty high pain tolerance and I can take some abuse, but I can also think my way through things. So you can punch me, but then I can also be calculated and, you know, strategize and, and, and especially in something like jujitsu, be move those chess pieces as they need to go. And so it just, as soon as I went in there, I was like, this is right. I didn't have any preconceived notion of competing at that point. It's like, oh, I just need to be doing this because this is fun. This is amazing. I want to learn it. And so I did. I, I, man, I basically fire hose as much of that as I could retain. And after about six months, I was introduced. One of the guys that was training in our gym was, was fighting. And so we went to one of the fights and seeing one in person and having practiced it to some degree, I was like, man, I, I think I might be able to do that at some point. And so I kind of put the bug in my coach's ear and they're like, yeah, we could work towards that. And, and it wasn't very long, you know, shortly after that, they found me my first fight. And so I had my first amateur fight. Um, at this point I had moved to, to a different school. I'd moved back home from, um, college. And so I was living at home at the time in my training in my hometown, had my first fight. I won in, I want to say it was under a minute. It was like 53 seconds or something. And I was like, okay, cool. When's the next one? You know? And so I, I strung together a, a pretty, pretty 
decent amateur. I think it was like seven or seven or eight fights um, in a row. I was undefeated before I finally turned pro. And, you know, at that point, it's like, cool, man, let's keep pursuing this thing. And, and so it just kind of grew from there um, until, until our, our second one came along. And then it was like, okay, now, now maybe is the time where I need to start shifting focus a little bit. It's like training and fighting with one, ma- paying the bills and, and making things happen, happen was, was doable. I knew once the second one come along, came along that that was going to be a bit of a stretch. And so looking ahead to the future, it was like, okay, well, this isn't really sustainable. This isn't as, as lucrative as, you know, some people may have you believe like, Hey, there's not a lot of money in fighting to you young and, and aspiring young fighters who may be listening chase after it, pursue it, but, but understand like, it's going to be a while or never that you can solely provide on that. And it, and it's a short-term solution. There are very few guys that can make a living and retire off of what they have done fighting. It's not like most professional sports. And so you don't do it for the money. You do it because you love it. Um, whatever, for whatever reason, you're just some weirdo who doesn't mind getting punched in the face and you like to hurt other people or whatever. And where you like being half naked in front of a cat crowd. I don't know what your deal is. Um, but whatever it is, do it for that. Not because, Oh man, I'm going to be the next Conor McGregor and make millions or whatever. Cause you're probably not. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. And then and, and if it turns out that you are, well, great, but don't go into it with that mindset. You're putting the cart before the horse just as a side, uh, tangent on there. Yeah. So that's how I got into fighting. <laughs> Very cool, man. And when did you, so you're, you officially retired. You're not fighting anymore. How, how long ago was that? I, I mean, I, I unofficially retired. So my last fight, I think it's, it's been about three years now. And so, you know, there, there wasn't like a big to do of like, all right, this is the last one. I'm going to leave my gloves here in the cage and hang it up. And it was just like, okay, my, my wife's going to have, you know, a kid anytime now. I think that was, when did I fart, fought, fight? Da, 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 da. Yeah, I mean, she was she was a couple months. Um, I, w- I believe it was March, and so she we had our son in April. So it's like, oh, okay, this is gonna be my last hurrah for a while. And uh, you know, Savage Gentleman has just kind of grown to the point where I guess Savage Gentleman is actually my third child. Um, it, it, the business is is very similar, not quite as messy, but equally as, as chaotic as, as, and stressful as times. And, and so it just made more sense to dedicate my time and energy into that at, because this is way more sustainable. I can do this. I could do this into my fifties if I wanted to, if I had to Pro, fighting, not so much. Right. So strategically looking at it, I, it would, you know, there's a responsibility to, for my family. It's like, okay, well at this point, if I continue to pursue this fighting thing, it, it is only now just for, for my own selfish desires, right? It's not really the most beneficial thing. And, and it, it became very hard to justify that. Yeah. But yeah. that's not to say that if an opportunity presented itself that I, you know, might not take it, who knows? I mean, stranger things have happened, uh, but in terms of like pursuing, so I'll, I, I won't say that I'll never fight again, but as far as like pursuing a, a career, I, I think that that ship has sailed for sure. Gotcha. Okay. You hit on something that really grabbed my attention and that would, and I think it's a good topic that we could talk about it as it pertains to fatherhood. You said something along the lines, I might butcher it word for word, but it was really like, I was able, uh, number one, I had a high pain tolerance. Number two, I was able to stay calm in the midst of the chaos that was going on in the ring, you know, so like mm-hmm. I could be getting hit, I could be getting beat on, I could be strategically thinking about the next jujitsu move, I need to put this guy in. But the theme I really took from that was no matter what's going on externally, all the craziness, all the obstacles, all the nerves, all the adrenaline, like all this stuff going on. One of my gifts is I can remain calm and I can think through mm-hmm. things. As you take that skill and you look through the lens of being a father, 
because kids can test you to the point where we have these knee jerk reactions and we just want to like freak out, right? Like, Oh, these kids, right. Or, or anything, right. could be a financial thing. It could be a challenge in our marriage. It could be anything, but it rattles us. It just rattles us. And sometimes it's really, really hard to keep our cool. And when I say keep our cool, I'm not talking about like, Oh, we're just going to go nuts and beat on somebody like, but keeping our cool internally to where like men can dig themselves a self-sabotage hole, like nobody's business. And it's Mm -hmm. the men that can stay. They have that gift of, or the training. I can stay calm. I can stay cool. I can think my way through this, no matter what's coming at me. So how, talk to us about that skill set from fighting to fatherhood. Yeah. And, and, and I do, I I do think that is, it can be a learned skill. I think, I think there is some inherent, you know, traits that will lend themselves to just naturally being better at it than others. Like certain people just run hot, man. Everything is right there on the surface and it doesn't take much to set them off. And other people, their thermostat just seems to run a little bit lower and it takes more to get their blood, you know, pumping. Uh, But wherever you're at, I, I think that you can adjust that through concentrated effort. I think one of the, uh, a very useful tool in that is some amount of stress inoculation. And then, and then, and then understanding how to take whatever that um, discipline or, or area is and transfer those lessons to someone else, because there's plenty of fighters who can remain perfectly calm in the cage in the middle of the storm and, and, and just see clearly and think their way through it. But you put them in any other setting and they fall to pieces and vice versa. There are guys who are calm, cool and collected in, in a boardroom, Right. And those guys are just absolute sharks in there. And then then nothing is ever going to phase them. Put that dude in a fist fight and he'll just go all to pieces. And, and so a lot of it comes to the environment that you are used to and then taking what you're used to and, and trying to apply that in other areas and, 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 and recognizing when you're doing what and where the carryover is. So whether it's fist fighting, whether you're, uh, you know, you, you go and you can just beat yourself up on long endurance bike rides or, or whatever, like that, that stress, stress is stress. Your body doesn't actually recognize the difference. And so if we can manage stress in one facet, we should be able to apply it elsewhere. If, if we take the effort to do so, the problem is, is we see them as disconnected and disjointed and we don't, you know, we don't apply them. I think that's, that's the hard part is learning, learning ways. Cause we all have experience. Like you haven't made it this far in life without learning something. Right. Um, and, and some more than others, but man, there has to be some times in your life that you can look back on it and have as reference points. Um, ones where you did good and ones where you did bad. And if we can remember what we did well and apply that and remove the stuff that we didn't do so well, we can, we can learn from that. And then the other tier would be seeking out new experiences that push that envelope a little bit further. Um, and, and again, this is where training martial arts or, or, you know, CrossFit or Spartan races or, or something. And I use physical stuff because it's just easier to connect. It doesn't have to be that, but that seems to be the area that's lacking for most people in this modern day age. It's like, yeah, no, I think everyone gets enough fast food and TV. Like we don't need to probably don't need to like uh, add any more of that to our lives. Like we're good there. We can, we, we know how to eat stuff. We know how to sit and watch things. Nailed it. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Sorry. You asked me what things I get spun up on. Um, and here we are. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like it. I like it. What, uh, as it pertains to, to marriage, what are some, what are some skill sets that you've, you've learned about yourself through, through marriage? There, there's Man, a, there's... I'm so lucky that I'm so lucky that yeah. I, 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 I hit the lottery <laughs> is, is what I've learned. Like, like, like I, she gives me so much grace that I absolutely don't deserve. Um, and, 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 and I, I try to be cognizant of that in, 
learn from that. I mean, in, in, in try not to make continue to make the same mistakes over and over again. I mean, I'm going to make mistakes like that's, you know, I'm kind of hard headed and, and while I can be smart in some ways, I'm real dumb in others. And, and so, you know, I, I try to recognize like, okay, man, she's giving me quite a bit of leeway here and, and I don't want to abuse that. And when I do, I need to really express my gratitude and my, my sincere apology for whatever. And then, and then go from there and, and, and make the improvements. I mean, I guess one of the biggest things that I've learned from marriage is, is, is how to communicate and, and how to, how to operate in, in tandem with another human. And as far as a partnership. So, I mean, my, 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 my marriage came first, my marriage came long before I ever had any idea of starting a business. And so that, that foundation for learning to work with another human in a, in a partnership uh, was, was built off of that. And that has actually helped quite a bit in my, my business relationships now as well, where I can use some of those same, same lessons and some that I had to learn the hard way um, against someone, you know, or not against, but rather with someone who, who maybe isn't quite as bought in, right? It's like, well, when you tie the knot, there's a certain level of commitment where you, you can back out of that, but there's a lot more to it versus some of our other relationships, whether they be business or personal. You know, it's a lot easier to sever those ties. Um, and so now I can utilize some of those lessons in, in other facets, which I think has been super helpful. So working in, I, I love that term, uh, the, with those words, you know, working in tandem with another human being. I, I look at like the skill sets of marriage, communication being one of them. Mm -hmm. And I say this a lot on the podcast because I usually compare, number one, communication is a skill. It's not a feeling, right? Mm -hmm. you, either, you either know how to do it or you're winging it. Active listening, a skill, empathy, emotional validation, all these things are skills. And what I think what I think is one of the biggest misses out there as it pertains to marriage is that, oh, I love her, so it should work. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. and if it's hard, maybe we're just not for each other, which I, I don't I don't buy into at all. That's like and what I say a lot on the podcast is the art of communication within marriage is a skill that needs to be learned. It needs to be honed. It needs to be trained. It needs to be practiced. Mm -hmm. And if you're not doing that, that's like me going into the cage with you. And I go to a coach. I'm like, Hey man, like I want to train for a fight. Oh yeah. Okay, cool. Well, we got, you got one today. You're going to get in the ring with Josh. And I'm like, well, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I haven't done any training. Like, what am I going to learn? Oh, you know what? You like this sport you'll be fine. Best yeah. time of your whole life. You'll figure it out when you're out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would, I would get pummeled. Right. I mean, the last thing I would see before I'd be knocked out is, is your beard, you know, like mm -hmm. just right. So at the same time, we don't expect that in any area of our life. Like mm -hmm. you don't expect that in MMA. You don't expect that to be a cop. You don't expect that in carpentry. You don't expect that. Yeah. Anywhere. You, don't, you don't, you don't go to the, to the ski resort you know, day one and go down a double black diamond. Like that just exactly. doesn't happen. Right. Right. You know, you know, you're, you're right. I mean, again, you don't take your, your five-year-old kid and kick them out in the English channel and say, good luck. You know, you, you start in the kiddie pool. Right. I um, mean, and so you're right. We, we, we are woefully ill-equipped uh, for the most part in, in entering in these partnerships, right. That are just happened to be for life with, someone of the opposite sex, which also means that there's a bit of a learning curve there as well, especially if we're younger. It's like, man, you don't even have that much life experience to have figured out your own self, let alone someone whose experience has been different in almost every single way from yours. And that was a big, big portion of the, the, the learning curve for, for myself is I had to learn myself in order to communicate better, I had in order to communicate, I needed to understand myself. I, at the time I only had one speed or one emotion and it was anger. And that was it. Like it was either 
everything was good or I was super pissed. Everything's fine or rage. And because I didn't understand how to communicate my feelings, right, or where those feelings were even coming from. And then again, feelings is not like a super cool thing to talk about when you're a dude. I get that. Um, but it, but it is a real, it is a real thing. You do feel stuff, whether you want to admit it or not and, and how you interpret those feelings and then process them and then project them, make a big difference on how you end up interacting with other people and how they interact with you. Um, and those interactions can be good or they can be not so good based off of what, what our output is, right? You know, we, they're, we receive what we put out to some degree. Yeah. And so uh, for me, a big part of that process was understanding where the stuff was coming from and to understand where it was coming from. I needed to know myself better and, and why this thing was making me feel this way. And, and, and for me, once I could start piecing those things together, then it, it allowed a different response then I, I didn't have to just resort to anger with everything. And so it would be like you going into your fight totally unprepared and you don't even know if you're better at striking or grappling or uh, wrestling or, or whatever. It's like you, you don't even know what you're good at yet. How can you be expected to, to have a game plan for winning this fight when you, you, don't even, you don't even know the rules really? Like no one's even told you the rules of engagement, you know? And so you're like, okay, well, here I am. And they shut the doors of this cage and got gloves on my hands. So maybe there's something I could do with those, right? And, 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 and that's where we often find ourselves is you haven't even spent enough time training to know what you're good and what you're not good at. And when you know that, now you can work on the things that you're less good at to make them better so that when you do step in, you have a lot more tools from which to, to draw from to you to solve problems because it's, it's just problem solving. You know, I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to make the comparison to say that the marriage is like a cage fight. Um, <laughs> Can for, be some, sometimes. for some people, right. maybe that is. Um, and so, you know, exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about here, but you know, I don't know, man. I mean, like when my wife looks at me and she's like, let's get it on. I'm like, all right. <laughs> now, uh, okay. So are you now, my question to that is, are you a guard puller or do you, um, do you go for the takedown and, and mount? <laughs> Wait, so what's sorry, a guard? Is that, is that too much? Is no, that man. Much? No, no, that's all right. Too graphic here. What, what's a guard puller? Like, what is guard, that? <laughs> guard puller is, so the guard is when you're on your back and you have the legs wrapped around. Oh, okay. Okay. Control. Yeah. So it's a jujitsu term. Um, it's pretty common and guys who, guys who wrestle are more prone to, uh, attack and, 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 uh, you know, get the dominant position of taking someone down and being, being there and for, in, in the context of the fight. Generally, that is more valuable, uh, guard puller means you kind of concede and, and forego the takedown altogether. And you just roll to your back and ask them to jump on top of you. Right. 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 And, right. and, 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 you know, meet their doom. Uh, there's like three people that will get that reference and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I used to wrestle and okay. w which I joke about it. I, I know what the ceiling of so many gymnasiums in my, in my area look like because how of, many tiles, how many tiles and lights do they have? There's quite a few, you know, I, I can <laughs> usually count. I'm like, Oh yeah, that's where I'm at. Okay. Yep. I'm there. So I yeah. where I left off here last time. Exactly. Exactly. No, you know, like, I want to go back to this whole thing that you're talking about with feelings, because I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, you're like, you're like, you are like the poster person, the poster man of like manly, man, savage gentleman, right? It's like, man, and I'm glad you're talking about feelings because here's the thing. There is a way to talk about feelings that's in a masculine way. And it's actually a cool way to do it. And I think that's called emotional intelligence, right? Okay, yep. Because I, I think one of the dumbest things that a guy can do is be pissed off. And you're like, what's wrong? I don't know. I'm just pissed. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not going to solve a thing. Right. And especially if you're like, like you were talking about is, is, is operating with another human being in your life, like your wife, right? So one thing I've one thing I've learned, and unfortunately I've had to learn the hard way, and I think a lot of guys have to learn the hard way, is like, hey, how do I understand here so I can express out here what's going on? Because here's the, the funny thing is, is 
does a woman want an airy fairy man who talks about his feelings and he's like a wet noodle? No, Mm -hmm. of course not. But a woman does value a man who understands himself and then can articulate what is going on so she knows where he stands. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest difference. And you know, there there are some things, me included, I used to hate the the word vulnerability, like hate. I still don't like it. I still don't like even saying it. But I do like the term authenticity, which is virtually the exact same thing. So if you're authentic, then you're okay with with allowing the other person to know the good, the bad, the ugly, everything about you for and what you are. And I think doing this dance of communication, one of the misses for a lot of us guys is I'm pissed. I'm this, I'm that. And when you ask me why, I kind of can't tell you why. I'm not even really sure. Which, which means if you don't know why you can't address the root of the problem and therefore you can't move past it right? or it's just going to happen again. And, and, I, you know, I don't like to look at things so much as, as good or bad. And that's not to say that I'm amoral by any sense, but we can, we can often assign a vulnerability, like a ah, vulnerability, bad, you know, this good, right. To what, to me, I like to look at things like that from the context of like, is it useful? Because there, there are times where it is useful for me to be vulnerable and there are times where it super isn't, right? Like, again, I don't want to walk into, you know, this uh, a high level business meeting and show vulnerability, right? If, 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 I'm, if I'm selling my company, I don't want there or, or whatever, you know, this transaction might look like, you know, I, I need to maintain a certain level of I don't want to say say posturing, but like, you know, there there is a a detriment to showing of weakness, right? Which which is how vulnerability can be perceived. It it doesn't necessarily mean that it is, but there's a time and a place for it. And there are some moments where it's super useful for me to to have that authenticity and 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 to genuinely show that vulnerability to, to someone else. And that could be, that could be to my wife. That could be to my kids. That could be to my business partner where it's like, Hey man, look, I, I got, I got to be honest with you here. And I got to, you know, I got to explain to you this situation in a way that leaves me vulnerable, but that's the only way that you're going to be able to understand and appreciate where I'm coming from. And that's the end goal. So I have to swallow my pride and, and, and bury my ego and say, okay, here's, it is what it is, man. And I, I messed up on this thing or whatever it, whatever it is. Right. Um, and again, I think that that is useful and necessary. The, the key is recognizing when it is and when it isn't. And that's where a lot of us are, are maybe not as uh, sensitive to that, to that timing. And that's what we want to develop is that sensitivity of, okay, when, when should I do this? When shouldn't I? Yeah. And I like, I like that. I like that. You you need to be self-aware. Yes. You and really need really, to be, Yeah. The whole thing kind of comes down to that, I think. I mean, if they, we're looking at the big overarching picture is, is a self-awareness and this, this um, uh, personal self-development, right? That, again, kind of feels, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's, that's a little too hippy-dippy or you know, too much incense burning or whatever for <laughs> folks. But, uh, you know, you get some crystals going, we burn some sage, and we just figure this out, man. And then we drop an elbow. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Well, and that's the thing. You can cancel anything out. You know, you can go as far, you know, down that road as you need to. If you punch someone in the face and choke them out, then yeah, it kind of works yeah, itself it's, out. It's, it's all right. It's all right. If I can beat you up, then that that inherently makes me more badass and more manly. So, you of know. Of course. Of course. And you and can talk about your good. feelings while you're down there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's let's have a conversation. Yeah. I'll I'll get you in a submission and then tell you about my feelings. Yeah. And then maybe I'll ask you how you feel about it. Yeah. And and together we'll uh yeah, okay. No, I, I've I've liked this conversation a lot, and I'll tell you why. Uh former MMA guy, uh savage gentleman says it all, right? But you one thing I wanna acknowledge about you, uh, Josh, is that you you have a lot of awareness, right? You, you you know who you are, you know what's going on, you've taken the time, the effort to understand it, and it's allowed you to obviously develop this really good relationship. 
with your wife. You know, you, you've, you've said over and over again that oh, I'm lucky, you know, she gives me a lot of grace. You're, you've got to be doing a lot of things right in order for a woman to be able to do that. And I can relate. I've known my wife for 24 years. We've been married for 17 years. And I always, I always joke with her. I'm like, God bless. You've got some patience with me. She's like, yeah, but you bring a lot to the table and I'm, I'm my own worst critic. I don't, you know, I, I'll tell you 10 things that are bad about me. And sometimes I have to really think about like, okay, what are my strengths? Cause I'm very aware of the bad. Sure. Mm-hmm. But you know, there's something to be said for that. You know, if, if your wife gives you a lot of grace, then you probably bring her a tremendous amount of value to the relationship. There's a lot of things that she value. And, and to be honest, women want to feel connected to us, right? They mm-hmm. want that. They want a masculine man. They want a confident man. They want to be led. And what I can tell you is that, but they also want to know all of us. But mm-hmm. like my wife will, will tell you, I think I've cried in front of my wife. I don't know, 24 years, call it 15 times, 10 times, 15 times. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not something that I do. I can't remember the last time I did it. And the, I remember probably the, it was a few years ago, I, I broke down and I kept apologizing. And, and I don't know what it was. It was something serious though. And she's like, why are you apologizing? I was like, I don't know. I just, I hate, I hate breaking down like this. Mm-hmm. And she's like, number one, you never do it. Number two, every now and again, I like to see the human side in you. Like you don't always have to feel like you have to have it all together. That in fact, she, she told me this and, and I've heard this from other female, other female guests who've been on the show. She's like, every now and again, I like to be the one to pick you up. All right. Mm-hmm. So a lot, when you, when you don't allow me to do that, you're robbing me of the opportunity to do that. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, damn, that's, that's, that's uh, I need to remember that one. Yeah, no, it, that's super important. Uh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was done. Okay. I, it's super important that we, that we understand that give and take, right? Cause it, cause that can actually be a two way street. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of, and, and, and actually I, I won't say that I'm more emotional than my wife cause I'm certainly not, but you know, she actually, we, we, we had, we had something the other day where, you know, she finally, she's like, Hey, I am at my limit. And, and and I was actually pretty oblivious because she was functioning so well. And it wasn't until she, she opened up and kind of, you know, was, was had to bear her soul before I realized, like, like I said, I'm, I'm sometimes I'm a little thick headed, right? I'm like, Oh man, this is serious. Like, like this is, you're really struggling with this thing. And I'm kind of on the mindset of like, well, all right, man, you're, you're doing, if I look over you and you're, you know, repping out your set, man, I'm not going to spot you. It's not until that thing is crushing your windpipe that like, Oh, maybe I should go over there and, you know, give this guy a hand real quick. And so I, I, I personally, I needed that signal to in, in that humanity and that vulnerability on her end, um, for me to really appreciate and understand and, and to drive the point home like, Oh, okay, here's, this is where I can intercede. And I think, you know, we're, we can be guilty of that as well, where we, we just bottle things up and we, we, especially as, as men, as dads, right. It's like, man, the weight of the world is on your shoulder. You can never be vulnerable. You can never open up. You can never show any weakness, right. Cause you're, you're the foundation that holds everything together. Um, and that's not to say that you're just this blubbering pile of mess that, you know, or every time a, a lifetime mu- movie comes on, you just fall apart, right? That, that maybe isn't useful, but yeah, we do need to be able to be human um, with each other. We need to, to, to show that side and we need to be able to and comfortable to show that side. But the only way we can do that is if we, again, recognize in ourselves where that is coming from and when it's appropriate and when, when it isn't, um, I, you, you would mention, you know, this idea of like self-awareness or whatever. And, and, and to me, I, I would say that, I, man, I, I still have a very long way to go. Like there's still, there's still so much that goes on and I don't know why the hell I thought that or felt that or whatever. Um, for me, it, it, it's just about paying attention and noticing things. Um, and, and that, that seems, that seems to help, you know, I don't have it all figured out. I certainly, 
don't have myself all figured out. I don't have all the answers, but I'm, but I'm working towards that, but it's a concentrated effort. And I think too many people don't, don't really see that as, as anything as like a value or importance. We, we just go through our life, head down, do the task, you know, punch the clock, show up here, do that, take the kids, drop them off, go to bed, this, 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 and this without very, with, with very little, um, second thought as to the how and the why and, 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 and whatever. And I think that that can be very dangerous and and we can become very isolated in that, right? We, we basically have boxed everything in and everyone out uh, to the point where we, you know, you see this, I'm sure you've encountered guys where, you know, 10 years into the marriage, like, you know, their wife doesn't even know who they are anymore because they haven't let them in, right? Things have gotten, you know, you, you built up so many walls and not to use, you know, all the cliches at once, but you, you know, you, you, you create this environment that just is not healthy for a, a good relationship and a good partnership. And we have, I think we have to be careful. We have to be cognizant of that. And, and the only way to do that is to pay attention I agree. I totally agree. One other thing too, that you mentioned, you know, for your wife to tell you like, Hey, I'm at my wits end right now. Like there, there's, there's something that you two have created, which I would call psychological safety, right. Mm. To where like, Hey, I'm fried and I need a break. Right. Because what I think most people do, men do this and women do this where they're feeling that way. And they're like, I can't say that. Or if I say that, he'll say that. Or if I say that, she'll say this. So I can't say that. And then what happens is you've got all these emotional resentment walls that start to build. They get pissed off. And then you wake up and you're like, I don't even like you anymore. Yeah. I don't even care. I'm, I'm so over it. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. resentment, the resentment is, is man, it's, it's a really bad thing to carry around, but we often do for whatever reason, we're, we're, we're afraid of how they might react. Right. We, we, we don't want to start a fight. Right. Right. We, we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to make things work. So I'll, I'm just going to, and man, sometimes I have found in my marriage personally, and, and take this with a grain of salt, this may not work for everyone, but the best thing that I could have done in that situation was to actually have the fight. Oh yeah. And, 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 and go through with it and get it out there. And, and, you know, I think you have to have, you have to have some boundaries, right? I mean, there, there's some, there can be some things that are, that we can say it and they cannot be taken back. Um, but uh, within that, I mean, and you're talking about the, what would you call the psychological, psychological safety, safety. Yeah. I mean, you know, there, you, you kind of have like your, your, your safe word, so to speak. Right. We're like, Hey man, there, here's the, you know, this is the alert. This is the situation. This is where, right. this is where we're at. Um, and, and both of you on the same page and you know, Hey, when this happens, this is what it means. And this is how we can proceed. But I think, you know, and, and we literally, we had a, we were, we stayed up till geez, like one yeah, thirty in the morning, you know, fleshing this thing out. And it was pretty emotional. It was pretty, pretty raw and visceral, but it was, it was very necessary. Yeah. And it was uncomfortable to be sure. Like, man, it would have been way easier to have just gone to bed and, and not dealt with that. But if you do that enough times in a row, you can, you can really, man, you can create that, that resentment and you start fostering all these really negative feelings and emotions and you wake up however many years down the line and you're like, man, I'm, I'm kind of over it. Because that person that you develop, develop the relationship has now morphed into something different, not necessarily because they have changed, but because you have allowed your perception of them to change due to your bitterness and resentment. Um, and, and for sure, people do change. And sometimes, you know, I'm not going to say that, that people don't marry the wrong person, that for sure that can happen. But I think there are a lot more relationships that potentially could have been worked through. Uh, that maybe weren't uh, due to a lack of communication or letting things go too far, right? There, there's a point uh, to to make things mechanical where it's like, hey, man, if you just tighten that lug nut, you're, you know, what I mean, there's some play, there's some wiggle in, in in the axle there, right? But if I, you know, the wheels wobbly, if I tighten that lug nut, man, it'll be fine. 
But if I continue to let that thing wobble and wobble and wobble and wobble, eventually, man, I'm going to, you know, just ruin those threads and the wheel falls off and you'll never be able to put it back on and keep it on. And I think, you know, sometimes we, we let stuff go so far in that direction that, Oh, we can't get it back. So that self-awareness and paying attention, I think is really important in our relationship so that we can catch it before it gets that far. I totally agree with you. I mean, and last, last point we'll make on this to really hit this home is your wife has got to feel that, you know, to be able to express those things. And then you do too, because men are notorious for, I mean, Dr. Robert Glover wrote a book. Have you ever heard of the book? Uh, no more Mr. Nice guy. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So he talks about in there, uh, basically these covert contracts that a nice guy has. And one, and a part of that is basically like, Hey, I'm going to do all these things for you, my wife or my family or whatever else with the expectation that I'll get some needs met, you know, and sometimes those needs are like sex or something else or whatever. But overall, what happens is, is when those expectations, which by the way, the guy usually doesn't even express what those expectations are. They don't get met. He gets pissed. He gets resentful. He bottles it in. And you're right. You said it earlier, which is sooner or later, it will come out. Mm -hmm. And it's better, like you said, sometimes it's better to have the conversation. It's better to even sometimes maybe even have the argument to hash it out, to work it out. Because this guy, the, the post that he made, he's known, he's been married to this woman for eight years. He went into this long explanation of what was going on. How was it? You know, she, she did this, she did that. And all of a sudden he just couldn't take it anymore. She came home, mm -hmm. he blasted her. And then he felt terrible because he blasted her and she was like, wait, what? Where did what? that come from? Where did that even yeah. come from? Like, why didn't you say anything like a long time ago? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that there's a lot to be said for like, you know, hey, let's press the pause button here. Let's have this really tough conversation. That's probably going to make us feel uncomfortable, but you know what? Let's have it. Let's get through it. Let's hash it out and be done. Yeah. And unfortunately, some of us don't do that. We'll just bury it, bury it. Oh, just, just don't well, worry about it. And, and you talked about the... Hmm the training manual or, or whatever, right. Or the lack thereof that we don't have any of this preparation going into it. And, 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 you know, what we're talking about here is not necessarily something that you can just uh, dump on someone because they may not be used to it. Right. They may not be used to this person. Like I was, I was weird for a professional fighter to be like non-confrontational, um, but I super was like, I hated conflict. I hated to have these, you know, arguments and, and my wife was, was intelligent enough to, to force me to do these things. Um, and so now that we have a, a, a working understanding, but we had to have that talk. She's like, Hey, look, I, I am a pusher. Like I am going to push because whether you like it or not, whether you re recognize it or not this needs to come out and I'm going to get it out of you. And, and I, that's just how this is going to work. And this was pretty early in the relationship. So she's like, if this is, this is going to be a problem for you, there's no point in going forward because this is how I operate and this is how I communicate. And this is how I have found to be the best way for me to work through stuff. And I was like, yeah, I really hate this. I hate everything about it, but I love you. So I'm willing to, you know, swallow that pill and it was you know, a pretty big one, you know, and, and very uncomfortable. It was a hard to swallow one, but I'm willing to do that because you, you know, you mean a lot to me and I want to make this thing worth, I see the value in the relationship. And so this was a conversation that we had pretty early on. And I think that that is important too, that somewhere before you get too far down the line, you, you, you start working through some of this stuff or at least developing some kind of SOP or, or procedure right? Of, Hey, how are we going to do this? Cause it's going to come up again. This is the, 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 uh, user's guide that seems to be left out where it's like, Oh yeah, you're just going to find that special someone. And <laughs> you know, you, when you know, you'll know, <laughs> right. <laughs> and you're lovey dovey and, yeah. and happily ever after, except for when it isn't. And then shit, now what? And the only model that you have is whatever relationships you may have been exposed to, and whether that was your parents, which may or may not have been healthy and great, or your grandparents or aunt and uncle or caregiver, whoever, whoever you happen to be around, or maybe you learn your relationship models from watching TV and, and cinema, 
which is probably not the healthiest place. But that's, you know, everyone is expecting uh, this notebook like relationship. <laughs> and, you know, maybe that's not the most realistic thing for us to, to shoot for either. But whatever it is, that's the only basis that you that you might have unless you right. have, you know, thought about these things and worked through these things and, and talked about these things through someone else. And, you know, we are getting worse and worse, I think, as a species at interfacing with each other in, oh, yeah. in, in real and meaningful ways. Uh, in you know, unfortunately, technology is for as, as, as good as it is, it is equally as detrimental in, in developing those skills where it's like, oh, man, you don't want to deal with something? Well, just turn your phone off. That problem goes away right uh, the, versus like hey this person is in your face and you're gonna have to like go upstairs and use the same bathroom as them or whatever or or not and i guess leave and get a hotel or stay with your friend or whatever and now we're talking about some real serious implications and so we need to to learn how to interface with each other better and in order to do that we need to interface with ourselves better and I think that's that's kind of the the order of operations yeah. there because you can't you can't do the the latter without the former or vice versa. You Agreed. Can. Yeah. No, I know what you're talking about. Hey, I, I know we're we're jumping to the end here. I want to make sure everybody can find you, uh, Savage Gentleman. All the things yep. you guys are doing over there. Uh, Kick ass name, by the way. I love that. Thank you. Um, but yeah, that. where can where can people follow you on social media? Uh, check out Savage Gentleman, the whole nine yards. I, I don't recommend people follow me. I would follow <laughs> me through a buffet <laughs> line to be, to be quite honest. But if they want to watch and witness and, and see the things that we're up to, they can, they can obviously check out the website, www.savagegentlemangentleman.com. Um, our Instagram, Instagram handle is Savage Gentleman Official. They can check that out there. Obviously, we're on Facebook. I don't do too much on Twitter, but you can follow me personally at Josh Tyler MMA on Instagram and Facebook as well. They're similar but different. I, I try to, I don't know, I'm still figuring that out, like how much of the, the business is me and how much of me is the business. And And some days it's, it's one and the same and other days there, I, I try to make a dis distinction and I haven't quite found that sp sweet spot as with most things in my life, I'm making them up as I go along and, uh, figuring out and see what works and, and, you know, getting rid of what doesn't essentially. So, so there's a, there's a couple of channels if people want to check us out. We do did, I, I like to say, do have a podcast. Um, with some decent episodes, some of them are, are less so, but if you're willing to venture down that rabbit hole, um, the Savage Gentleman podcast is another place you can check us out. Uh, I would, I keep telling myself we're going to revamp this thing. And we had this conversation last year. Yeah, man, we're going to get this going. And literally the last episode that we released was the one that you and I did together. If that No is. way. Wow. Yeah, no, it's, we're, we're really bad. Well, every, all efforts have been, focused on on making wallets which is a good thing right like you know, i'm not complaining that people want to buy our stuff like that's awesome it just you know i've only got two hands and in, in so many hours in the day so we're, we're actually working on expanding we're gonna be moving into a bigger place you saw probably some people in the background and and i don't know how much of the audio that was picking up but we've got guys we're bringing on to help grow this thing and and hopefully turn it into you know a legitimate respectable business um and, and i guess until then we'll fake it until we make it um which is all, all that we can do so yeah you can check us out there and and if people want to reach out to me directly shoot me a dm or or what have you i'd be happy to talk more in depth obviously i have no issue running my yap um <laughs> at length and so i yeah i really appreciate getting having the opportunity to get on here and chat with you it's been really really fun Hey, back at you. And guys, don't, don't worry about having to memorize a thing. I'll have all of Josh's links, social media, website, whole nine yards. Just go to gooddadproject.com forward slash 209 for this show. Again, gooddadproject.com forward slash... I'm sorry. Two, did I say 29? Anyway, I'm just going to read it. 209. 
two zero two nine zero is what oh, I meant to say. Yeah. Two ninety. Wow, you're getting up there, dude. I'm- Actually, man, we're at, we're over. I mean, we do three shows a week. We're over 600 episodes oh, now. It's geez. crazy. Yeah. Lots. Gosh. And we've never done any replays. Every show we've ever done has been new content. A new one. Yeah. That's amazing. Where now I feel like a, now I really feel like a, an underachiever. Nah. Son of a gun. Podcasting is not for the faint of heart. That's all right. You could throw an elbow that would knock me out. So maybe, maybe, <laughs> um, you know, and someday, well, you know what you, you have given me something to aspire to, sir. Um, I, I really appreciate it. And super man. See, that's why you're a pro. You've got the links all set up there. So people don't have to memorize anything. Just click on it. That's yeah. That's the way to go. If I could only say I'm right though. Right. So yeah. Good dad. <laughs> good yeah, good dad project.com forward slash two nine zero. There you go, two ninety. That's why that's why that's why God made uh editing and and that's right Adobe Edition. You can just cut it out, man. Easy <laughs> that's day. right. That's right. Josh, man, thank you so much for coming on today. My pleasure, dude. Thank you. You bet. Take care.